you see everybody. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and uh, come to you with joy-filled hearts for your presence in our lives. What a blessing that is and what an uplifting kind of thing and an energizing kind of thing that is for us in these times which we find ourselves. We look about us and we tend to be very, very negative and not to be very positive about exactly what all is going on around us. But we know that with your presence, we can feel positive things and we can be energized and we can be, we can find joy even in times that seem to be very, very difficult. We know this morning that uh, some of our friends in other parts of our country are uh, having to endure some absolutely unbelievable kinds of circumstances and conditions. And so we lift each one of those up and ask that you would be with them in very special ways, our friends in Kentucky, Arkansas, Illinois, Indiana, and other places. And we particularly this morning pray for the volunteers and the first responders who are literally putting their lives on the line to try to rescue, trying to comfort, trying to restore and help people begin the healing process that they must begin. Be near to each one of them and give them not only the strength that they need to endure, but more importantly, give them that hope that you are still God and that you are present with them, even in these very difficult and troubling times. We likewise now also intercede on behalf of all of those in our immediate church family, those in our extended church family, and those whom we bring to you in our hearts. And we ask that you would be with each one, that through your divine presence and through the work of your Holy Spirit, that they might find comfort and peace, hope and assurance that they need to face the difficulties they're encountering. We thank you likewise for our church. We know that we've had some hard times behind us and we've yet got to endure some hard times ahead, but we know that you're walking with us and we know that you're guiding and directing all that we do on this journey that you've begun, that we have begun through your leadership. So continue to guide us, continue to lead us, continue to place before us opportunities not only to serve, but to go and to tell as you lead us and as we help to lead others to know you as Savior and Lord. Be with us as we study because we are so limited in our understanding. And particularly in this time of the year, what a joy it is to reread the stories that we've heard throughout our lives and that inspire us, that warm our hearts, and at the same time give us that sense of hope that those who experienced it firsthand those hundreds and hundreds of years ago, likewise, we can experience it. So be with us in these times as we worship, as we fellowship, as we pray and as we study, but more importantly, be with us as we leave this building and where, wherever we find ourselves and go out into the world and be your church. And it's in Jesus' name that we lift this prayer. Amen. We're in Advent 3. Advent 3 is uh, one of those that I've always enjoyed because even as a child, I was sort of taken by shepherds. Where I grew up, we didn't have a lot of sheep. Sheep growing in, in uh, northeast Louisiana was not something that really set the world on fire. My grandfather had some, and he hated them. And I kept asking him, why did you raise those things? He said, oh, they're so cute. <laughs> and so, uh, but so, you know, the shepherds are people who are not unlike other farmers. Right, Marie? Right. It's hard work. 24 Carla Day has um, 150 adult sheep, and she has a whole lot of, like almost 100 babies now. 150 sheep and 100 babies. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of sheep. So she's a shepherdess. And there's a book you need to read then. It's called The Shepherd's Life. It's, it's about uh, a shepherd up in the uh, Yorkshire Dales in Northern England. But in any event, the shepherds have captured our attention for a long, long, long time. We sing the songs, we read the scriptures, we pretty well know the stories. And I think one of the things that is so special always to me, and I don't apologize for that, is that in Advent we have access to so much wonderful music that helps us not just understand the story, but truthfully to tell the story. Oh, 
one, two. Thomas Carlyle made a statement that has always sort of resonated with me. He said, music is well said to be the speech of angels. Be the speech of angels. Those of you who have endured this class with me for low, 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 all these many years know that I've always said that there's nothing that warms the heart more than to hear a small child say. There's something about music. There's something about music that sort of lifts us out of where we are and raises us up to a level of understanding and appreciation about what's going on around us. And it is the kind of thing that can help us endure even what may seem to be the most difficult times. I'm gonna play a piece of music for you here to sort of start this class because I think it sets the tone for the story about the shepherds or as I titled this lesson, Telling because that is a big piece of the story of the shepherds. And to me, it really is more important than all of the things that we used to read about and hear about. So let's listen to this setting of a poem that uh, John Rutter put with Cambridge Singer. Everybody hear that all right?
don't you love that? And I sort of like a paper clip. I wish I had done that. <laughs> but anyway, so music is what feelings sound like. Christmas and music, you can't have one without the other. I think if all the music of Christmas were silenced during Advent and the, you know, the Christmas day and the days following, I think it would be a real dark kind of a situation. Because truth be told, as I said, music has the ability to sort of engender in us a whole host of different kinds of emotions and different kinds of feelings. One of those is, is that I think when I began to think about my own growing up, my own childhood and experiences with Christmas, music has always been a very special part of it. But so many times it was sort of external, but still it was internalized. Does that make sense? In other words, you hear it on the radio, you go to church and hear it sung, and it's sort of out there, but it, everything becomes special to you. So when you think of Christmas, when you think of Christmas, is there a song that has a very meaning to you? Is there a song that when you hear that song, it sort of lifts you a little bit higher than some of the other songs of Christmas. What have you got? Folks online, folks here. What's your favorite song of Christmas? Sorry? Silent Night. Silent Night. How about our virtual friends? Do you have another one? I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Oh, good. I'm glad. And, and we didn't plan this, but I'm going to get to that one in a little bit. So these all speak to us. They have something very special. There's something emotional about them. Uh, whatever it might be that there is something about music. And so what we find is, is that well, Georgia Cates, I think, really got it right when she said, Music is what feelings sound like. And she adds a couple of words out loud. Music is what feelings sound like out loud. Sometimes we know life can be extremely, extremely tough. We find that we can encounter situations that literally bring us to our knees. And it may be something that happens all of a sudden or it could be something that has been sort of cumulative and it's been building and been building and been building. And then all of a sudden you say, Ooh, I can't handle this anymore. And it just overwhelms you. Psychologists talk about an effect that's called the dark night of the soul. Shanda, I bet you know about that. The dark night of the soul. It's where we find ourselves in, in almost a hopeless situation. And we find ourselves thinking that it doesn't matter what I do, nothing is going to change. And worse than that, nothing is really going to get a whole lot better. What that really is saying is that there's not a whole lot of hope. There's not that hope that sort of engenders within us that notion that I can do this, I can overcome this. But music has played a part. It's not the sole remedy for that. But it certainly plays a part in the way in which we're able to recover. Now, in the time of Jesus' birth, I'm not going to go through the whole history because you all know it. Times were about as oppressive for people, underprivileged people on the fringes of society, as it could possibly get. And those who had the least from them was most expected by the Roman government, by their church. And they had to just keep giving and to keep giving and keep giving to the point where uh, many of them just literally threw up, threw up their hands. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of my favorite writers, as you know, and he said this, he said, God is not ashamed of the lowliness of human beings. He chooses people as his instruments and performs his wonders where one would least expect them. 
God is near to lowliness. He loves the lost, the neglected, the unseemly, the excluded, the weak, and the broken. Life was tough for shepherds back then. Still is. Still is. But in Jesus' day, it was especially so because if all they had to do was their work, it wouldn't be so bad. The weather would be bad. You have to deal with illness and sheep and, sheep and dangers from uh, animals and thieves and so many other people who would in, in circumstances that would do them harm. But there is a lot of writing out there that talks about shepherds. And basically what it says is that they were not considered to be very nice people. In fact, they were down near the bottom of the social ladder rung. They were about as low as they could get. I don't know about that because there's just as much evidence that says that the opposite is true. I mean, after all, what was David? Okay, so you can weigh both of those. But be that as it may, shepherds were not the wealthiest people in the world. Shepherds were not the cleanest people in the world, just by the nature of, of what they did. So they were pretty much despised, and that, that despising manifested itself among those who should have been the most encouraging and uplifting of the shepherds. Look at a couple of three examples here. Rabbis actually banned shepherds and the keeping of sheep, sheep and goats in Israel. Couldn't do it. In Jerusalem in the time of Jesus, Jeremiah said, the rabbis asked with amazement how, in view of the despicable nature of shepherds, one can explain why God was called my shepherd in Psalm 23rd. Haughty religious leaders basically created a caste system. And in that system, the shepherds paid the biggest price for it. They were the ones who were pushed the fathers down in the system. They were officially by the church, by the church leaders, blamed, uh, uh, labeled as being sinners, meaning they were a class of very, very despised people. Luke tells us very, very beautifully that into this world, into this system in which the shepherds found themselves, into this darkness of the night that existed, not just physically with sun going down, moon coming up, but the darkness of the soul kind of circumstances for the people of Israel. In the words of Forrest Gump, God showed up. And that is so amazing and wonderful to me because as we read the Bible, we see there are so many times in which people have found themselves in extremely extraordinary circumstances <laughs> and God shows up. God does something that is absolutely miraculous and marvelous. It is just amazing to the human spirit. Enter this social context of religious snobbery and class prejudice, God's son stepped forth. How surprising and significant that Father God handpicked lowly, unpretentious shepherds to first hear the joyous news. It's a boy, and he's the Messiah. What an affront to the religious leaders who were so conspicuously absent from the divine mailing list. Even from birth, Christ moved among the lowly. It was the sinners, not the self-righteous, he came to save. That's from an article by a fellow by the name of Randy Alcorn. It's fairly interesting. If you want more details, and I gave you a few down there, you can check it out. But it's really, really interesting. But I like the way that he worded this because that just further confirms from, um, for us this whole notion that God is the champion of the lowly. God is going to always be on the side of those who've been disenfranchised, those who have uh, been pushed to the margins, those who are hurting and needing help. So what do you think was on the minds of those shepherds? I think we need to just sort of cast ourselves back into the physical circumstances in which they found themselves. We celebrate Christmas in December, but actually if it happened 
as we assume that it does from what Luke wrote, it was probably in April or so in spring because otherwise the shepherds would not have been out in the fields with the sheep, but that's neither here nor there. That's a minor detail. The bigger detail comes later. But cast yourself out there. You're on a very dark night. <clears throat> Stars are shining, beautiful out there. The sheep are settled in. You're sort of settled in as the shepherd and you got one or two of your brother shepherds with you. Maybe you've had a reasonably good meal and just kind of relaxing and thinking about what has happened during the day. Things are just proceeding as normal. You're very vigilant because there are wolves. There are people who would come and want to actually steal the sheep. So you got to be very careful about what's going on. <coughs> so <coughs> into that circumstance and into their world, God showed up. And when God showed up, he did it in an absolutely amazing way. He sent some of the best spokespeople he could find. He sent some of his angels. And those angels said words that these poor, lowly, probably illiterate shepherds were absolutely amazed at. First of all, can you imagine being on that moonlit hillside and hearing a voice from heaven, a bright star shining? What do you think? And what do you do? How do you react in that moment? I would have been terrified. And I suspect that was probably, probably what happened to them as well. God sent them an inv invitation though. He said, I want you to go to Bethlehem. You're gonna find a baby and he's in a manger. You know the other details. But he didn't stop with saying go there, it's, you're invited to go and witness this event. And notice God's angels did not appear to the chief priests and the scribes, did not appear to the wealthy merchants in the area, came to shepherds, said, we want you, I want you to go and I want you to see. But he didn't stop there. He also arranged to have a concert in the fields. Any of you have been to a place like Wolf Trap, or an outdoor, where you have an outdoor concert, it's special, isn't it? It's different, very, very different. Uh, I was in uh, in London. Actually, I was in Richmond, which is out, just outside London. And there was an outdoor concert by a local symphony. And it was absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. Jets were flying over from Heathrow and all of this, but you didn't pay any attention to it. The music was just something special there in that kind of a setting. And so here we are, these shepherds are out there and all of a sudden, these angels start singing. Ellsworth Callis is a person that I drew upon for a lot of the information that I'm having using in, in all four lessons for, the, for this Advent study. And he's written some really interesting comments about this. He said that there's the possibility that that invitation did not occur at night just by chance. Because we know that in the scriptures, Isaiah earlier had said this. He said, the people who walk walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. These are those people he's talking to, Isaiah's talking to, who are experiencing, experiencing that dark, deep darkness of the soul, are in those kinds of circumstances that just absolutely seem untenable. Gary? Yes. Um, the, the shepherds were not surprised about a savior being announced. They, they didn't have to explain, God didn't have to explain to them who he was and, and who Jesus was. So um, you, you have that, plus uh, the note thought I had, the glory of these angels singing was best seen out in the dark fields, not in the city lights. And, uh, you know, 
But also they could have been literate in a way because David was, and he called, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. And he knew he was a shepherd, uh, a shepherd. <laughs> he kept his father's sheep. So um, I know we, we have these two different ways of looking at the shepherds, but yet there is uh, evidence, like you said, of both, both ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. That's good. And that, and she's absolutely, Jan's absolutely right. You know, at, at nighttime, we tend to be a little bit more sensitive. Our senses are a little bit, a little bit more acute. So it was into this darkness that, that, the, that this concert occurred, that the angels came, that God gave his message to shepherds. And again, Jan is absolutely correct. It is interesting that he didn't have to do a whole lot of explaining. Most of what the angels said was, go to Bethlehem, find this child, and everything that they would see. So the shepherds got an invitation to a holy event, and then they got a concert. It's interesting that some of the most beautiful, some of the most moving, um, some of the most inspirational music of humankind has absolutely come in the darkness, not necessarily physical darkness, but in the darkness of the soul. Charles Wesley, for example, wrote his most, uh, most powerful hymns among hundreds of hymns that he wrote as he sought ways to uplift the spirits of people who were deep in sin, certainly, but also who were experiencing unbelievable kinds of hardships. At the height of the Reformation, when he was being pilloried right and left, Martin Luther was moved to write that most moving of all hymns. Uh, and, and, and it's such an uplifting, encouraging, inspirational hymn. And we know that for our African-American brothers and sisters, some of the most beautiful music in that genre came out of the experiences of slavery. Jan mentioned Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. It's a fascinating story, it's a beautiful story. His wife had died, and this was in the midst of the Civil War. And so he was already overwhelmed by um, the, the terrible kinds of circumstances that sort of were coming out of the war itself. And then that was compounded with the loss of his the loss, law loss of his life. And he got to the point where he basically said, how inexpressibly sad are all holidays. He could find no joy anywhere. Uh, he was one who was literally, literally in the depths of that dark soul kind of experience. But then he absolutely was moved on Christmas and wrote a poem called Christmas Bells. And when you hear the words of that, of that poem set to music, it has become, as was true with Jan, <clears throat> one of our favorite, one of our most inspirational carols of the season. Those words say things like, God is not dead, nor does he sleep. God is alive, God is well. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. Inspiring words, moving words, words of hope, words of encouragement. So as Callis said, Christianity was born literally in the darkness of human experience. So when people like Longfellow, like us, find ourselves in, in those points in our lives in which we just simply don't see that there's any avenue for escape. And we turn to God because we find that God is all that we have. It's, he is the only resource that uh, we, we can, uh, our brains can even figure out some way to go for help. But as the statement needs, when we go there, we find God is really and truthfully all we need. So, just as our world, both then as well as now, needed some kind of renewal, some kind of redemption, 
Remember there had been a period that's called a period that was referred to sometimes as the period of silence that God did not speak at all between the Testament's time. And so people had, were still reading in the Torah. They were still hearing the priests and the scribes talk about this notion of Messiah, but they could see nothing that indicated that that was going to happen. But we have always as Christians sung this song. I love it. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Into, the, into thy freedom, gladness, and light, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness, into thy health, out of my want, and into thy will. Out of my sin, and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. I still get cold chills, even when I sing it, even when I read the words. Because that is the kind of song that just is chock full of that four-letter word that inspires human beings forever and forever. Callis said, most of us hear better in the night, just as Jan was saying, that the shepherds probably were able to experience the glory that was all around them when those angels began to sing because it was at night as opposed to being in a 5,000-seat auditorium somewhere. point that we need to understand is, is that it's not so much the quality of the song itself, but it's the way in which we hear both the words and the music in the song and how that has an effect on us. So the charge, I think, for all of us, both at, in the Christmas season as well as in all seasons, is to be attentive and be ready for the fact that God is probably going to speak to us at some point. And if we're not tuned in to hear his voice, if we're not open to welcoming that voice, we'll forever forgive ourselves for what we have lost, and what we have missed. So we have to be awake. We have to be alert. And as I said, the, the, the thing that, that sort of pushed me to use this particular lesson on this third Sunday in Advent is the fact that the shepherds did more than just experience the presence of God's angels, experience the voices of, God, of God's angels singing, and being in the presence of this child, Messiah, the Son of God. They had to do something. They felt absolutely compelled to go to do something. And so when the music stopped, the shepherds could have done any number of things. They could have even left while the music was still going on, just out of fear. When you go to a concert, and it's been an especially good one, there's several things that can happen. I, I know in my own experience, usually when you hear just an, ab, an unbelievable performance, I don't care whether it's by James Taylor or the New York Philharmonic Orchestra or whoever, it's almost as there's just one little moment in there and it's like, it's like the air has been sucked out of the room. It's happened here in this sanctuary many times for me. I don't know about for you as well. And you just, you just feel that there is something there. And once that vacuum is filled, you feel like you've got to do something. If it's at a concert, we applaud. We applaud loudly. Sometimes we give a standing ovation and we keep applauding and keep applauding, hoping that we're going to get an encore. Well, the shepherds got their heads together, got their act together. And after that music stopped, what they did was they said, let's do what we've been directed to do. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord, I cannot read, has told us about. They had to go and see. They had to do something. Had to do something. I've been in God's presence and I knew it in a very special, very powerful way. Many times it happened and I could not do anything. 
And then other times it happened, I literally just had to get on my face and say, wow, God, thank you. We have to do something. We're compelled to do something once we've been in the presence of God. So the shepherds did that. That's exactly what they did. They went to see this child. I love this. Picture them in the manger. lovely. I love those last words because I think they speak to what we're trying to get at here. Our love, our hopes, ourselves, we give to your son. When the shepherds decided on what they were going to do, they ran to the king. They literally were compelled to go and see. And then what we do know is that they didn't just stop with seeing. They didn't just stop with being in the presence of the Holy Family and Jesus, the Son of God. They had to go and tell some others. Here's what Luke, how Luke records it. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning him and told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Several things come out of this little quick, quick, quick piece of scripture here. Mary treasured up all of these things, just as the shepherds were overwhelmed with questioning in their mind about what was happening. Don't you know Mary did as well? Sandy Wright is going to sing, Mary, did you know? That's Mark Lowry's way of basically giving us questions that Mary had to think about. But here then in that presence, in that holy presence, they did something that we are called to do. They had to go and they had to tell. I'm reminded of a song that uh, goes back to the period of the 1960s and I hit a button here. And it was one that uh, I know you all are familiar with it. Pass it on. 
words are right there on the screen. The words are in your, in your notes as well. But it's the kind of message that I think aligns so beautifully with this story of the shepherds. I'll shout it from the mountaintop. I want my world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. God gives us something that's good, something that is more than we could ever hope for, much less imagine. We have to tell somebody about it because it's such a special, special moment. So here we find ourselves then on this third Sunday of Advent. And we are also uh, again reacquainted with words that are very, very familiar Words that the shepherds heard, glory to God in heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. And what we have to do is give that same message to others. My suggestion is, is that as you give that message, don't just recite the scripture, but personalize it. We become better tellers of God's story of the gospel message when we tell our own story, when we personalize it. And this is, the, this is the case here. For example, when we look at this particular scripture, we would say, Do, don't be afraid, Leona. Look, I bring you good news, Bobby. Wonderful, joyous news for you and all people. Because it's when we personalize something, then it becomes owned. When we personalize information, it becomes special. Those of us who've taught for a long time know that one of the most powerful things you do, you can do as a teacher is call a person by his or her name. When that person knows that you know them, that you know who they are, and then you respond to them, that makes what you're trying to say even more special and more and more powerful. I'm going to move on here fairly quickly. The heart of this story is that God chose to come in human flesh. We know that. And when that happened, heaven came down and literally glory filled all of our souls. It filled the souls of those shepherds. And so when that child came, that was a special moment for them, but it's a special moment that continues to endure, continues to inspire us even today. Let's end with this.
I've got this movie. Mm -hmm. Hope that we can all kind of um, go forward through Adventing and really begin to appreciate it, enjoy it more what we know and what we understand about the shepherds, about so many other elements of the Christmas story. And don't just get caught up in the story that we lose sight of really what the meaning is there. Any comments? Mm -hmm. Y'all have a good week. <laughs> <laughs> See you. Thank you. Thank you.